So since it's four o'clock, so first of all, welcome to everybody. And I'm not going to say anything because I have Professor Doro Norbach, Hi, who's Doro. going to introduce our eminent speaker. So I just want to say here that I am super ultra happy and very grateful that you accepted this invitation. We're very honored to have you here. I all told all my students and all the ones that I know that they should attend because this is a talk not to miss. And I leave Doron now to do the introduction. Doron, it's yours. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone in Israel and uh, all other times throughout the world. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my friend, Professor Twi, for uh, joining us, for accepting our uh, warm invitation. Uh, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce you. In fact, your uh, short CV and, 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 and details were published uh, in, in the invitation. But uh, what I would say that uh, uh, Professor Twi is one of the most... Uh, creative scientist that I know. Uh, I think we are lucky that he fell in love in the fields of electrochemistry, batteries, whatever he would touch, he would, uh, he would uh, do the best, uh, the best scientific work because of his innovative uh, mind. Uh, so uh, during the last decades that uh, Professor Twi, uh, uh, let's say, joined the uh, Material science, electrochemistry, uh, energy science uh, 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 community. Uh, uh, Professor Tui published many hundreds of uh, publications uh, in the best journals uh, in, 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 in chemistry, um, in fact, in best journals in science. And uh, he, he brought together a nanotechnology uh, amazing uh, uh, capability in chemistry and material science to energy science in solving uh, uh, acute uh, problems in electrocatalysis, in passivation phenomena, in uh, 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 how to store charge in materials, uh, interfacial as aspects. Um, uh, the, the contribution of uh, Professor Twee to the field is amazing because of the innovative manner. If, if, if we think about a high energy density batteries, there is no single uh, a fraction of time that we have thermodynamic stability. So all the, all the operation of batteries is, uh, is um, uh, metastable and uh, we need to uh, deal with uh, interfaces with bulks that have to work simultaneously uh, through very complicated charge transfer. And there's a lot of phenomena the, and a lot of uh, aspects that uh, uh, have, to be in, uh, have to be taken into account. First of all, we worked on all the scope of, of, of topics, cathodes, anode, electrolyte solution, interfaces, all kinds of batteries, electrocatalysis, hydrogen-related uh, electrochemistry, and uh, in whatever, whatever, in, whatever he touch, whatever he touch, he brought with him innovation, innovative mind, how to solve problem with 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 a good chemistry, and I believe that he will share with us in a, he will share with us a, a, a few of his uh, uh, capabilities and and achievements in in, in this talk. Just uh, to mention that uh, uh, we have metrics uh, uh, through which we measure scientists. So I believe that this. H factor is more than the 200 and maybe 210 in these days. Uh, and, and if you look through his, uh, uh, his performance in terms of papers, where he published the citation, the, 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 the number of people that he educated, he has many people that are now take a, a academic position throughout the world. With few of them, I'm in touch and you, you see the fingerprint of uh, Professor Twee in all his uh, previous uh, students and postdoctoral fellows. They, 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 was, they were infected by his uh, innovative manner. And I, I, so I see it uh, everywhere, uh, uh, also with, with the people that he educated. So Professor Twee, uh, you, you really deserve uh, the, the, the honor. You deserve this uh, warm uh, 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 introduction. And uh, we are looking forward to have uh, 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 beautiful talks as, uh, as usual. So <laughs> now I think the stage will be yours. 
Well, Dolan, thank you so much for the very nice introduction. Well, in my uh, career working on batteries, well, Dolan, you are a pioneer. I learned so much from you, reading a lot of your paper, educating me about batteries. So it's not, this is not an overstatement. I certainly would like to thank uh, the uh, IVS uh, for the invitation. I apologize, the previous event, <laughs> I have the time mixed up <laughs> a little bit. I guess in the early discussion with Sydney, uh, we said that with uh, so many Zoom meetings, we all get Zoom out sometimes, particularly with the time zone difference, uh, the time mix up. Uh, I appreciate uh, AV, IVS to, to invite me to give this lecture. Uh, I have so many friends in Israel. I, uh, I remember several years ago, my trip to uh, Israel, that was just been, that's just been fantastic. I really cherish this uh, friendship. Thank you for uh, inviting me back uh, to uh, give this uh, uh, lecture. Let me share screen. Uh, I see where it is right here. Can you see my screen okay? It's the right view. Okay, good. Yes, uh, yes, 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 with your screen, yes. Okay, so let me share with you uh, past 16 years, what I've been doing um, and uh, indeed learning from uh, pioneers like uh, Dora. Uh, I get into the field 16 years ago without knowing anything about batteries. It's trying to re really the thinking of uh, fighting climate change. Uh, so batteries are the areas up, after I study, I, you know, for a little bit, I said, well, it sounds like this is really important. So, but I really didn't know much at the time. So this is now the 16 years. If I look back, I say, what I've been doing is really try to bring new materials uh, to a new understanding, new tools to solve the, the grand challenges of the Baptist problem, you know, and, and in a sense is try to reinvent uh, the, uh, the, the batteries. So batteries are important, no need to repeat, right? So whether it's for a, a portable application and a stationary a storage, there, there are huge opportunities right here. And the development of lithium ion in 2019, uh, was recognized by uh, with a Nobel Prize in Chemistry, uh, John Goodenough, Stan Whittingham, uh, Yoshino, uh, for the development of lithium ion. This is probably one of the best prize given uh, by Nobel Committee. Right? This has uh, fundamental science as well as uh, practical, important uh, society impact. Uh, then we ask the question in retrospect, you know, we have been asking this question uh, long before certainly uh, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize was given. Uh, what are the grand challenges for the batteries field? Um, so in, in a sense, we need to reinvent batteries, right? Make, make it uh, not only significant better, maybe dramatically better. We asked the question, how high energy density can batteries go? Uh, measure in watt per kilo or watt per liter. Can we extend the battery life by three times or longer? Much longer than three times, right? We talk about, well, can we do 30 years? Grid scale energy storage will need it. 10,000 cycle, 30,000 cycle. There are some lithium batteries chemistry right now can do up to about 10,000 cycle, but we want to do it in a way, you know, uh, regularly with uh, high energy density, low cost batteries, or even longer cycle life, 30,000 cycle. What does that mean? That means if you do one cycle per day for 30 years, you are somewhere about, you need about 11,000 cycles. You are doing three cycles per day, and uh, you could need uh, more than 30,000 cycles. That, that's the rationale. How fast can batteries be charged? How do we do that? You need electrons transport, ion transport, interface stability, lithium plating problem, and, and so on. There's many, many problems showing up, right? The strain, stress, can we do within 10 minutes? Can we make batteries completely safe without catching fires? You have been seeing batteries will catch fire. 
uh, once in a while. And particularly go to very large scale energy storage, that's, that could be challenges. Can reduce the battery cost by three times or more. Particularly when you go to grid scale energy storage, if you want to do seasonal storage, I will argue you need to reduce the battery cost by 10 times. Right, that's a, those are very challenging problem. How do we sense battery's health condition? What are the methods for battery reuse and recycle? With such a scale, large scale coming up, you likely you're going to see the next five years, the battery production will be increased by 10 times. Uh, in a decade also, you know, 20, 30 times easily. So this, the huge resources needed to build this battery, we need to consider reuse and recycling. Grid scale seasonal storage, I just mentioned, needs to be very low cost and uh, flexible, available, stretchable batteries for specialized applications. So these are the questions we ask over the years. And how do we enable that through science, through chemistry, um, to, uh, to address these challenges. So 16 years at Stanford now, my lab tried to, build, uh, tried to build out a research program to answer some of those questions. I don't have answers for all the questions, maybe for some of them, we are kind of uh, partially through, mostly through uh, materials design. Uh, let me uh, you know, really highlight you know, some examples, uh, particularly on the high, energy density batteries. Um, when we look at high energy density, we require you to store a lot more charges inside the materials. Well, this is the plot, vertical axis is the relative volume change of the materials once electrons and lithium coming in, right? Certainly you say it doesn't need to be lithium, it can be sodium, or it will be similar phenomenon right there, or magnesium. Uh, horizontal axis is the number of lithium ions you store versus, versus the host atomic ratio. The more you store, the bigger volume expansion you are going to have. So, and we are right now is one versus six roughly, right? One versus six or one versus five. These are the existing materials, uh, you know, uh, really getting the, uh, winning the Nobel Prize for, right? We know how to store lithium, uh, spend about six uh, host atoms to store one lithium. Well, once we go up to the curve right there, you're going to store more and more lithium. Well, lithium has charges, lithium has volume. So degree of volume expansion in terms of percentage will go out a lot. For example, if you go to metallic lithium plating and stripping, if you strip it away, it's empty. Once you plate it back, you have certain volume. In the relative sense, it's infinite. There's no host atoms right there. It's called hostless storage. So the challenge goes up more and more. Uh, this is, this is uh, use, uh, Ya Yuan was my graduate student. Uh, uh, I asked Ya Yuan to make this plot. Ya Yuan is an amazing person. She's joining now uh, uh, Johns Hopkins as a system professor starting from uh, on January 1st. So now you look at this, you say, well, what are the challenges we need to consider, right? In the past 30 years, the success of uh, lithium ion batteries uh, using stable host, whether it's graphite, whether it's lithium cobalt oxide, lithium ion phosphate, right, or MMC to store lithium, they're stable. Well, there's no, really no chemical bond breaking right there. And uh, on the right side, the new materials with much higher capacity, there are significant chemical bond breaking, sometimes nearly completely bro breaking. Uh, host atoms move to long distance because you have so many lithium coming in. These need to rearrange, become new structure. All the host atoms need to move around. Complete structure change, gigantic volume expansion. That's uh, 10 times more than traditional materials. And so all these challenges presenting to you from atomic bonding scale to individual particle scale, and to the whole electrical scale. These are all, of course, very challenges require new thinking, the paradigm shift, how to design materials to overcome these problems. 
but if you could do that, enable new materials, for example, we are now using graphite and uh, this lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide called MMC. That's roughly about 250, 260 volt per kilo, right? That's uh, used in a Tesla car, for example. Uh, and um, or, or NCA, these uh, family of materials. And well, if you replace silicon with MMC, potential you can go up to 400, slightly above 400. Lithium metal coming in with MMC, you could potentially reach 500 watt per kilo. And lithium and sulfur, 600 and more uh, with that potential. Of course, this pathway is not entirely easy. This require really uh, you know, a lot of scientists coming in to, uh, to overcome you know, the materials and chemistry problem along the way. Um, so let me show you the first example of which is silicon. And when I started at Stanford, I uh, look into these uh, materials right away. Silicon is known to store lithium uh, with this alloy phase diagram uh, based on a high temperature study is a lithium 4.4 silicon, which is still 4,200 million mile per gram compared to the uh, graphite, right? That's uh, you, you have about 11 X of the capacity. And silicon also has the right potential to be an anode. It's low, it's close to lithium metal. Um, uh, the potential is of course very important if the potential is not right, when you build a full cell battery, you're going to lose voltage. So silicon also have the right potential, but silicon has this volume expansion about four times, 400% of volume expansion. You take a silicon particle, lithium coming in, expand. Well, what happens if you have so many lithium ions coming in, right? They break, you create huge mechanical stress. It will break. And how do you avoid breaking? How do you build stable solid electron interface? Silicon is sitting in the end now. It will decompose the electrolyte, generate this uh, solid electron interface. And the Doron is an expert in working on uh, uh, you know, looking into SCI. And uh, you know, even very early days proposed the SCI model. We'll, we'll come back to that. And uh, together with Palay, uh, uh, you know, two Israel scientists uh, proposed the SCI model. The challenge for silicon is because of you have volume expansion, once lithium coming in, if lithium going out, the, then the particle will shrink and you don't have stable interface, right? Uh, to, uh, to build a stable SEI. Um, so these two problems are, are coupled, breaking, expansion breaking in SEI. So in, in 2008, my, in January, my lab published this paper started to use uh, the nanoscience approach to design material and say, well, how do we solve those problems? Um, and uh, first let's overcome mechanical breaking and uh, electrical connection. So we published paper in Nature Nano in January and really analyzing the problem of, of course already built on the research uh, in, in the past uh, of uh, some of the understanding on silicon. And growing this silicon nanowire, this maintain uh, efficient electron transport. What's also important is this wire grow of the current collector, bonded to the current collector, this metallic foil. And the diameter is small enough to relax the stream without breaking. And, uh, and lithium ion can come in and going out so you don't break it, you maintain electrical contact so you can, can maintain the capacity. Um, Candice was my first graduate student. After I told Candice about this idea, you know, she was just a brand new graduate student. She was excited and working on it. So we published his first paper. What turned out to be certainly, this is the one really sent my group into the field of the batteries. Uh, by now it, it accumulated a really big citation. Um, so we need to understand right, how silicon expand and break. Uh, we have conducted a whole series of study. I can only select a few examples right here to share with you. Together with uh, Bill Nix, um, a mechanical expert in my department, uh, my graduate student, Matt Madel, who is now a professor in Georgia Tech, right? We developed this approach using in-situ transmission electron microscopy 
build a nano size batteries in the in there. So having a cathode that's lithium cobalt oxide, and now a silicon nano wire connected with a GoPro with ionic liquid as the electrolyte. Ionic liquid has very low vapor pressure, even under vacuum condition inside TEF, it can survive the vacuum condition without drying up, without evaporation. And lithium coming in, electrons coming in, we start to charge silicon wires. This approach also allow us to uh, charge silicon particles. The particle connect with these wires. Then we watch what's happening here. We really learn a lot of information using this approach. So let me share with you, this is a silicon nanowire. Surface is coated with copper. Scale bar right here is 200 nanometers. So this is about close to 200 nanometer diameter wires. If you look at this, you say, well, you charge up the silicon wires. You can see the volume is expanded. This expansion is so powerful. It breaks the copper coating on the surface. If you need to store a lot of lithium going in, uh, you, can avo you cannot avoid uh, the uh, volume expansion. Suppression volume expansion is not possible, you know, because it's atomic size uh, of a lithium coming in. You put so many, they're going to expand. What you need to do is design the right structure, let it expand, but without breaking. Let it expand in a controlled way. So now let's look at uh, what about this question in the field? What's the critical breaking size? You know, in the early days, the uh, hypothesis would be if the structure is small enough, it will not break. But how small do you need them to be without breaking? Then in this uh, in situ TM, you see we have a number of particles right here. Um, and they have, they have different size. In the center, you have 800 nanometer diameter particle to start with. Surrounding is you see small particle. Now you can look at many particles during charging. You see this particle, right? The uh, silicon becomes core shell structure now. And the center is a silicon core, crystalline. And then the shell become lithium. Silicon is amorphous. Now the stress building up, you see the center particle get broken. So this big one gets broken. We have looked at a large number of particles, roughly about 150 nanometer diameter. That's a, you can take that as a critical breaking size. Below this size, it doesn't break that much, but, but above this size, it breaks a lot more. It's not a sharp phase transition right here, by the way. It's a roughly about 150. Statistically, Statistically, about average, about 150 nanometers. You can see that's the, the average transition size. Nano critical breaking size is about 300. So this reason behind is how stress build up. If the silicon particles stress build up three dimensionally, nano is have this elongated axis, but the stress build up is in the radial direction. So there's this different consideration here for, for different dimension. So we figured this out of a critical breaking size, providing the guideline to the industry. And it really this critical breaking size would be very important for industry to know. And uh, when industry try to avoid breaking. So over the years, we have been designing multiple generation of silicon from nanowire to start with. This is a, a very exciting, you know, uh, my lab, uh, start to move full speed into the battery field and cause your structure hollow, double wall hollow. So this has been through multiple generations. It's, it's, this is not about playing the game of morphology. It's not about that. Indeed, through this whole process, there's a guideline right there for us to design materials. It's actually try to overcome the problems, expansion and solid uh, electrolyte interface problem. You know, we try to also imagine whether self-healing can be used mm -hmm. and we have self-healing polymer implemented. And, and, and we have multiple generation now. Let, let me share with you the uh, uh, really key thinking right there. And this is another important one I consider in, uh, in the whole uh, silicon 
uh, uh, anode design. And also this could be in general for the very high capacity material design. Uh, that is how do you build stable SEI, solid electron interface. If you look at cross section of silicon particle or wires, like right, this is cross section. You put lithium in, lithium and silicon forming alloy, volume expand a lot. It varies electrolyte build this uh, SCI. You, you, you take lithium out during this charge and silicon shrink. Once it shrink, it can easily break this SCI coating because the interface shrink, right? You could imagine. And then next cycle, lithium coming in, expand again. You, you're gonna need to build a new SCI because the old SCI is already broken. So before long, and you build up a thick SCI, you consume lithium, you consume electrolyte. The batteries die, decay really fast. So if we think about hollow structure and the hollow structure will do the similar thing of volume expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. It's also not stable. There is how do we solve this problem? We need to have a stable, dimensionally stable silicon surface first. So, and this idea, I still remember and during my vacation in Hawaii, and then I kind of thought about this. I said, wow, this may be a solution and talk to my postdoc, who is now a professor in Tsinghua University, very talented person. Silicon, uh, blue color, we build this double wall hollow structure. The red color coating is mechanically strong, but still allow lithium to go through. And once volume expansion takes place, the red color coating force silicon expand towards inside. Because we leave space right there, you could force it to expand towards inside. Lithium coming in, cleave the silicon silicon bond. And silicon is not as strong as just silicon, right? It's a lithium silicon alloy. It can be forced towards uh, uh, inside expansion. Build the SCI. During this charge, you take lithium out. The interior surface, you know, come back. Now, you know, you never move the outer ends of interface. Now you can have this SCI building up. So I was really excited about this concept. Turned out to be, this could be realized experimentally. And uh, we compare silicon wires along, silicon nanotubes along in the middle, and the double wall hollow tubes. That's in the bottom right here. You know, after you do charging this charging cycle, you can see the bottom case. The solid electrolyte interface coating onto this individual tube, but it's not that thick. Compared to the single wall silicon hollow tail or silicon solid wires. And this already forming SCI film, we decompose a lot of SCI because that decomposition rebuilding process, right? Of SCI bro broken process. The bottom case is a lot more stable. We demonstrate even after 2000 cycle, you know, this uh, material is stable. So this is very exciting to us. Now we feel like this is a materials concept that could work. Certainly pay attention to this. This is still not yet practically practical battery because in the practical battery, there's other consideration we need to take into account. This is for really see what's the material design principle we could use to overcome the SEI problem. Then we can use this uh, principle to design the practical solutions for the real batteries. So let me share with you, this is a one potential practical solution. So, and how, how do we build the SCI now becomes clear. You don't want to have volume expansion towards outside, you want it to be inside. And you want to have that interface that's stable. And using nanoparticle nanostructure, there are a few big problems we need to overcome. Number one is a nanostructure surface area is too big. It decomposes electrolyte so much. Number two is, well, how do you pack this particle together to have high tapping density? You don't sacrifice volumetric energy density that much. You want to pack them together. The third is because of nanoparticle, in order to build up the capacity per unit area of the electrolyte right, projection area, you need to pack these materials together. You have so many nanoparticles or nanowires. If the, the electron needs to jump 
through this uh, nanostructure so many times, you need to maintain good electrical contact. Otherwise, your electrical resistance will be too high. So with this thinking, we say, well, how do we really try to now pack the particle, reduce the surface area and connect them together? We come up with kind of permagranate type of design. So what's here, this is cross section of this, you know, uh, secondary particle design. You have individual nanoparticles in there. Each one we build a share of uh, carbon and leave enough space for the volume expansion, but we don't want to, you know, leave too much empty space. After volume expansion, it becomes dense. And using this structure, you do the carbon coating, then the electrolyte cannot wet inside to individual nanoparticles. It can only wet outside the uh, secondary particle. If you build this uh, particle to become one to 10 micro, and nanoparticle is about 100 nanometer or less, like you, you avoid the breaking. Then you look at the surface area of secondary particle. From nanoparticle to secondary particle, you go from close to 100 meters square per gram of surface area, go down to single digit meter, right? Let's say about one meter square per gram. And you reduce the surface area a lot to avoid the uh, a lot of side chemical reaction. Basically, you are packing about 100,000 of these nanoparticles together. So how do you do that? We uh, you know, develop a synthesis based on a micro emulsion. Having the nanoparticle in you know, a water phase, this first in the oil phase, forming this water droplet, each water droplet evaporate, aggregate your nanoparticle together forming secondary. This nanoparticle is silicon, silicon dioxide, cautious particle. And then you coat it with carbon. Once you, you know, get this particle together now, when you coat the first carbon layer, still having some nanoscale pore, you can etch away silicon oxide, leaving the empty space in there. And then further coat it with more carbon, seal the outside, make sure electrolyte doesn't come into wet all the carbon. So you think this concept, now we solve multiple problems and uh, to uh, enable high columbic efficiency cycling. That means you reduce the uh, effective surface air of silicon. So that has been really exciting. You know, uh, in 2008, I, I founded the uh, Empress to commercialize the my silicon anode technology. Empress is now having a, a silicon batteries, rechargeable one up to 450, actually no, more than 430, now it's 450 watt per kilogram. Uh, supplying to the uh, Airbus Cyphers S, uh, you know, allow uh, uh, Airbus to break the world record 25 day continuous flight time with our batteries. And uh, I'm also happy to report a few days ago, Empress announced uh, the silicon nanowire based battery can do fast charging from 0% to 80% fast charging at the energy density of 370 watt per kilogram, right? The fast charging time is within six minutes. It's just incredible. Dorong, this is, I want to share with you. I mean, you work on silicon, silicon for quite a bit and silicon for fast charging is, it's, it's just incredible to see. And its potential is slightly higher compared to graphite. When you do fast charging, it's uh, harder to plate out lithium, turn out to be. Actually, the iron diffusion inside silicon is good. And because the silicon capacity is high, right? And the thickness of the electrode required to build up uh, the uh, uh, three milliamp hour or four, five milliamp hour capacity, the total thickness is low for the electrode. Then the electro electrolyte transport is not that as limited compared to graphite. And all these uh, property really favor silicon for the fast charging. Uh, uh, I'm so excited to see uh, six minutes into 80%, right? This is so much faster than uh, what graphite can do. So, and uh, this year um, I wrote um, a one page, uh, uh, article right here. And Nature Energy has this whole series called Tales of Invention, uh, telling the readers about, you know, some of the important battery material. What's the story? Uh, it's, uh, this is about telling story 
from beginning to until nowadays, right? Uh, I, I, I actually spent uh, quite a bit of time to study the whole history of silicon uh, back to uh, 19, uh, roughly about 1970s and uh, how people studied lithium silicon alloy uh, phase diagram. At the time it's a really high temperature batteries until nowadays uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the people involved in, in the study, some of the uh, milestone in, in the silicon, uh, if you're interested in, uh, this is uh, only one pa page of uh, story. So it uh, could be interesting to read. Uh, so with silicon working, so what about, um, what's next, right? It's, uh, well, lithium metal and is so important. And uh, certainly back to uh, 1960s and uh, 70s, and people already start to look into metallic lithium. Uh, and lithium metal is a plating and stripping mechanism. Once lithium plates out, there's no guarantee it's a flat uh, layer by layer plating. You have this SCI layer right there, you're going to break and cause cracking. Even without high current density, just very low current density charging you easily grow out this uh, dendritic duty structure. This uh, breaking spot is a hot spot, right? You, you know, you're going to grow out this, sometimes we call this as a lithium dendrite because it, it can be a dendritic structure. And when you do stripping, you can strip away lithium from the bottom. And then you are going to cause this isolated lithium. Oftentimes we call this as a dead lithium because it, you lose electrical contact with uh, uh, underlying uh, lithium foil, they, they are no longer active. Uh, uh, unless, you know, the accidentally, if you plate out lithium again, you're going to break into this SCI, connect with some of this isolated lithium, maybe it can be reactivated. So then over cycle, you're going to build out uh, this dead layer and porous layer, too high surface air decomposed the electrolyte. And remember during this process, if you need three million hour per centimeter square, that's 15 micron of lithium plating. That's a lot of thickness change. So, and back in 2017, we published this paper analyzing the problem and saying, well, the, the root causes are perhaps is this infinite volume change in the relative sense and high chemical reactivity of lithium coupled together to cause all the surrounding problem if we need to solve lithium metal, let's look at the root causes. How do we solve high chemical reactivity and also infinite volume change issue? So as Stanford right here over the years, we have really tackled these two root causes by um, one is uh, working with so collaboration with Steve Chu. Uh, he came back from, to Stanford in 2013, uh, stepping down from secretary of energy position. Uh, in 2016, we published a, a number of papers and really initiate the concept of stable host. We say, well, if you don't host lithium metal deposition, you lose control of where they will go, right? You lose control of this volume expansion and you want to build these uh, um, uh, host material, hosting lithium deposition so you can make it stable. Uh, you can have a stable interface to build solid electro interface. And then what's the nature of interface is important. And we want it to be chemically stable, mechanically resilient. Otherwise it will not be stable. So we have been a TAM and with a design in the background of whether it's amorphous carbon or with a nano diamond or boron nitrous interface or cell healing polymer, particularly with Zhenan Bao. We have been working on this, uh, uh, you know, interface design for a number of years now. Uh, let me share with you some of the examples here. Well, first of all, how does the lithium play? In order to control lithium plating, we need to understand how the lithium is really plated. This is an example of lithium plated on copper. If you look at this curve, voltage versus lithium, and a very low current density, 10 microamp per centimeter square, you play lithium coming in, you see this over potential, and then plating becomes a plateau. This over potential voltage deep right there is indication of a nucleation event. Lithium plated on, onto copper. 
but lithium plated onto gold is different. If 200 millivolt versus lithium before lithium plating happening, you see a voltage plateau. That's lithium and gold forming alloy phase. First alloy phase, second alloy phase formation, and then plating happening. Once the plating is happening, you see what? Well, there's really no over potential right there. So on gold, the behavior is very different. So what's happening is because copper and lithium phase diagram, you look at this and gold and lithium on the right hand side, close to pure lithium, that's the moment lithium about to be plated out, right? That's close to pure lithium. Um, copper has no solubility in lithium, but gold has some solubility in lithium. So we look at the case of gold, what happened is starting from gold, you play lithium, uh, then lithium coming in, you're going to walk from phase diagram from left to right, it formed the alloy phase, and then a, another alloy phase. Certainly this phase diagram, right? You know, oftentimes this is a constructed based on the high temperature experiment or, or simulation. And, and, and the room temperature lithium plating, you, you could not see all the alloy phase showing up. We see two at room temperature. Then lithium has the ability to dissolve gold away, forming the solid solution before lithium plating happening. What's happening is lithium may, is making gold more and more look like lithium by dissolving it away and then the lithium plating happening. So this is really exciting is lithium has this ability to have this gradual change and the plating happen. But between lithium and copper, lithium cannot dissolve copper away. Copper and lithium, they have different crystal structure, different atomic spacing, lattice constant. They don't really like each other. You need to have some over potential to nucleate the lithium plating. So using this idea, we actually screen a bunch of materials. For example, carbon indeed at room temperature also have the uh, over potential for plating. And, but certainly if the carbon has a lot of other functionality like oxygen and, and so on and, and nitrogen, then the story might change. I'm talking about a carbon you know, without those uh, significant uh, of those func functional groups yet. So carbon has over potential. We are designing this structure for the first time of lithium host. Put lithium, uh, the gold seeds inside. Then you say, I'm going to play lithium. Lithium needs to decide, it would like to nucleate outside on hollow carbon or inside that could be on the gold. The hypothesis is they like to nucleate onto gold. So and grow inside then this carbon function as interfacial layer allow you to interface with electrolyte to build SEI. So with Steve Chu and our joint postdoc Kai Yan, we, we, we made this structure and this is hollow carbon with gold seeds in there. Uh, this hollow carbon diameter is about 10 micron, oh, sorry, one micron also less than one micron. And let me show you the in situ video to prove lithium has the ability to dissolve gold away. So this is the one we start to play lithium in there. And once lithium coming in, you see the gold get dissolved away. Um, and uh, once you play lithium, uh, extract lithium going out and the uh, gold comes back. Well, lithium really have this ability right there. It's just uh, so fascinating to see this in situ video. Um, so, so using this uh, seeded hollow carbon in the bottom right here, we build the electro, we deposit lithium. You don't see lithium dendrite, lithium filament going outside. But if it's hollow carbon alone, lithium metal will like to nuclear outside from the dendritic structure. The bottom case is a lot more stable. Uh, uh, so this is pretty exciting to see. And, uh, and then we say, well, how do we build a host? Uh, not by electroplating, but by doing chemical synthesis, you know, then you can process that in a larger scale. So we developed this modern infusion. Uh, Ding Chang and Yao Yuan have been the two graduate students doing that. They are joining now, uh, you know, faculty in Johns Hopkins. They are actually become husband and wife by working on this project together in my lab. Uh, they are now both, you know, joining the same university uh, as faculty. I'm so happy for them. So, molten lithium infusion 
into carbon. We want you to use carbon as a host, right? Once you melt lithium inside glass box, this needs to be done inside glass box with argon atmosphere. You see lithium kind of bore up. They don't like to wet. This all type of carbon until we try graphene oxide and lithium wet and then going in. So apparently this wetting phenomenon here, and we, we, we call a new term called lithiophilic. That's a wetting. Otherwise it will be lithiophobic. So you only use 8% uh, by weight of graphene oxide. You can see that, you know, you have this graphene oxide stick, uh, stack and lithium coming in, open up the gap. And actually graphene oxide has this OH functionality, COOH. And this react with lithium a little bit, you know, the delta G gives free energy or reaction is negative, right? And then this is wetting surface. This nanoscale uh, gap, nanoscale gap is the uh, created a capillary force of wetting, but pulling the molten lithium going in and forming this beautiful golden color of lithium metal embedded between the uh, 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 graphene oxide. It's actually become reduced graphene oxide, we call it RGO. So uh, we, we prove this is uh, you know, a lot more stable for lithium deposition and well, stripping away, right? Because you have the, now the host materials keep the dimension stable, having the empty you know, space for lithium plating to happen. So at, at last, maybe a few minutes, I know my time is uh, uh, running uh, out pretty soon. Uh, let me uh, share with you a very exciting discovery. And uh, for the students and, uh, and friends right here, particularly you work on lithium metal. And for a long time, we basically say isolated lithium, they're mostly dead, right? You know, uh, 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 only for the exception is some lithium metal might accidentally get connected during plating. So we ask this question, is really lithium, is li that lithium really dead? <laughs> Very interesting question. So this paper will be coming out uh, maybe in a week also in, in nature. Um, so we ask this question, you know, you have beta, you have cathode, you have anode, and then you play lithium, and uh, you cause isolated lithium, they lose electrical contact with your anode. And we are drawing this right here. Is this lithium just sit right there doing nothing, right? And it can react with organic electrolyte, but it doesn't respond to anything, right? During charging and, and discharging, we try to analyze this situation. If you charge cathode and anode, right? Even though this lithium metal, this is isolated metallic island in the middle, not electrically connected, would it respond to the charging and discharging signal? Well, they can be polarized because when you do charging and discharging, you pass current, electrical current right here. There will be ionic current inside. You will have a voltage gradient in there. Once you have during charging process, for example, charging process is you put electron into lithium, right? Lithium ion into lithium anode right here. Your electrical field gradient is like this. And so electrical field is setting up like this. You're going to polarize this dendrite. Uh, because electrical field is going this way, you will accumulate negative charge to the left side of this dendrite, positive charge to the right side. Well, once you have positive charge uh, accumulated on the right side, what does it mean? It means it will like to dissolve away this lithium zero valence atoms, become electrons and lithium ion. Lithium ion will go into the electrolyte. Electrons will you know, go to the lab, accumulate to the lab. But accumulate to the lab, these electrons will now combine with the lithium ions right, and on the left and become neutral. So what's happening during this process, you polarize this isolated lithium island. The right hand side is dissolved away. The left hand side will be having deposition happening. So now the right hand side keep dissolving, left hand side keep depositing. It's equivalent to this dendrite is moving to the left because the left side is keep de depositing, right? So, and then during this charging process, it's the opposite. The left side is all the way, the right side get that position, then the stanza will move to the right. So it's moving. 
uh, even though they're electrically isolated, electronically isolated from anode or cathode. So this is amazing, you know, if this is happening, so we want to prove that. So we create an island of, uh, by deposition, some island of lithium in the middle with cathode here, anode here, and during charging process, right? You know, at the beginning, these zero hours, after charging process, you see after three hours of charging, the right side of lithium now get dissolved away, even though this is isolated island, electrically disconnected from anything, and the left side have lithium deposition. So this is a cell, this is polarization. It's caused corrosion on the right side, deposition on the left side. So in the discharge process is the opposite. Now the lithium deposition for this middle island goes to the right. We actually simulate this process and find that's true. You know, doing electrochemical simulation, you know, you can having the deposition, cell dissolution from the right and deposition to the left. And this is very exciting. Now this caused lithium isolated island to move. Now we are thinking if you cause it to move to the anode, the lithium metal side, it can get, get connected. And now once it's connected electrically, you, you activate all this uh, lithium metal. So we actually proved that this process, uh, this is probably, it's probably not enough time to explain the whole thing. We see uh, with these uh, isolated lithium activated, uh, you can have this activation. You can see that in the watch is curved. You can gain more capacity coming back. It's, it's very exciting for us to see uh, uh, this is happening. So, um, Maybe I'll only spend a couple more minutes, then I probably need to stop and answer the questions. Um, so a few years ago, uh, in my lab and in collaboration with Jinan Ba, we also started to get into the electrolyte design. Very interesting. You know, this has a, a huge opportunities right there. Dorong is a super expert in these areas. Uh, so, and we, we learned quite a bit from, uh, from your pioneering study. Um, <clears throat> for example, DME is used a lithium metal. We say, well, you know, why don't we extend these two this carbon chain, make it longer, <laughs> uh, change the so that can help change the lithium solution structure, make it longer is um, also decrease the polarity here a little bit, you know, stabilize this molecule. And then we say, we if we add in the fluorine in the middle, you know, two fluorine on this two carbon, another two fluorine, it turned out to be nobody has uh, uh, made these molecules yet because we couldn't find a cast number for it. Um, so and we actually show with this called FDMB molecule, the cathode side using fluorine to help stabilize on the oxidation side of, you know, uh, of this electrolyte, it's a, become a lot more stable. And not only the anode side, the lithium metal side, the, uh, <laughs> we, we use this protocol Dorong you invented, you know, we, you, we, we, everybody kind of using your name right, right there, we call ABAS the cycling method right now, using ABAF method. We, we now showing this is 99.52%, really, you know, uh, close to the record type of performance of electrolyte showing up. Turn out to be this electrolyte can uh, 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 affect the lithium metal plating morphology instead of then they're forming this uh, much larger size of green, green. reduce the surface area. The SEI structure is a uniformly amorphous, you know, uh, uh, it's really uh, interesting. And we also see the solvation structure between lithium and this FDMB so different. They actually forming this ring compound. You know, usually electrolyte is no color, but this lithium, uh, you know, uh, FDMB electrolyte is actually brown color because there's certain resonance structure of this ring pattern created. And, uh, and uh, this is an iron rich solvation structure creating after that decomposition is a solid electrolyte interface. It's an iron rich. It, it's really, really interesting. Uh, so uh, I think we start, I probably don't, have enough time. I know I should supposed to talk about for only for 45 minutes or so, probably leaving some uh, time for questions. So this is an exciting one. Uh, no time to go into, we developed the cryo EM technique to study the battery for the first time, you know, publishing this uh, in 2017. Uh, amazing uh, technique, uh, a cryo, cryogen stabilized the lithium related material for you to obtain atomic scale resolution without breaking it. 
and uh, we could resolve uh, uh, atomic scale resolution of metallic lithium, start to resolve the uh, SEI atomic scale structure. You know, uh, these are the two uh, SEI uh, model proposed by one by uh, Dora, the other by uh, Palais. And we have been uh, validating these uh, SEI models. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. Uh, I, I think I should probably just come to the end uh, by, uh, you know, thanking uh, uh, my uh, research group and also the funding agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I want to leave some time for the uh, discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll stop right here for now. So um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Tui, for this inspiring, I would say, a usual, <laughs> usual uh, uh, type of uh, lectures. Uh, that, that you uh, that you deliver uh, with uh, uh, a very nice uh, spectrum of uh, uh, innovative work. Uh, a few of this was uh, even uh, new for me. I, I want to, to to start with a question. You sh you show the practical silicon uh, anode based battery uh, with the uh, which was produced by M M M Amprius. So. The, the, this silicon is monolithic uh, silicon nanowires uh, that you uh, developed uh, about a decade ago, more than a decade ago. John, um, this is uh, <clears throat> so I developed silicon wires and also core shell silicon wires, uh, both. Um, so this from Amperes is uh, more using the core shell structure. Uh, the core shell structure turned out to be, you know, having a core that can. Uh, so conducting to ship electron very efficiently. Also, the core is a very strong mechanical support. So it, it they are nano wires. They are co they are coached, but they are coached on nano wires. Uh -huh, interesting. No, because I worked, I, I had collaboration with uh, Amprius about more than more than a decade ago, and we worked together on your uh, uh, silicon uh, monolithic uh, silicon electrode with uh, silicon nano wires. Yeah. And, we demonst and we demonstrated that the silicon nanowires have very good structure that can accommodate the volume change of silicon. So we, were we, we could demonstrate very nice uh, uh, cycling results, even at elevated temperature. So, but this is a, so this is a, this, this specific battery is a, is, a further, is a further development. It's a further development. The basic structure is similar, but with a, a few, uh, I think, uh, uh, changes in there, particularly, I mean, it's based on a core shell structure, but it certainly also details how the SCI, what's the surface coating, you know, could be improved and, and that, that kind of thing all, all, all blended in, yeah. I uh, should uh, make, make uh, one more uh, comment, which is important, I think. Uh, uh, even we look at your work and, you know, with the, the, battery, the battery field is very practical and it needs a, uh, I would say yeah. solid, uh, solid, uh, uh, very solid, and, 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 and simple options for for for, for preparation, etc. So even if uh, some of the development that you showed are not practical, but they are very important to show the power of chemistry, because I think that the the the, the work that you demonstrate, even if it's not fully practical, it has a very important added value, showing how we can use. Uh, chemistry in the most innovative way uh, in, in, in fields where we have uh, maybe the highest reactive systems in nature. So, and, and, and we reach metastability by, by unique uh, passivation phenomena based on, on, on very innovative uh, uh, synthetic work. So I think that the work has its, in, is its uh, 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 independent importance, uh, independent to the, to the practical aspects. And this is, uh, I think, uh, so I, I really encourage you <laughs> with this, uh, with this uh, with the directions, uh, because it really extends uh, our capabilities as chemists. So now uh, uh, the, the, uh, I can ma manage a, a discussion. So how we make it, uh, uh, Daniel? Maybe who wants can ask questions. In fact, I had one. First of all, thank you again. A fascinating talk as, as expected. I have seen two or three talks of yours already and every time I came out delighted. So you, you fulfilled the expectation this time too. Thank you again on behalf of IBS. 
One question I have for you, which is, you know, we see a lot. Um, I love material science and I'm fascinated by the thinking that goes beyond behind all these generations, for example, of the silicon, all the others. If you had to choose one, one specific innovation you did, either this or on the textiles, you did some other things and so on. What would be the one that you think in material science that was a wow moment of applying material science concepts and getting something really special on it of all these things they presented so far? So you mean including the bare face and the textile and others? Yes, uh, for example, yes, any any of the things that you did, even the ones you didn't present it here. <laughs> Gilbert, you're asking me which child I like the most. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a challenging problem. <laughs> to uh, well, you know, I, I like them all, but you say in terms of material science, the certificate, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the complexity, the delicacy of materials and chemistry, right? I would say it's absolutely the, probably the silicon and lithium metal work, these are anno. Uh, and uh, those problems, you know, keep, I keep discovering the problem, but keep coming up with these. And sometimes I'm also surprised I could get to that level of uh, uh, design thinking. I mean, it's also, this area also are the areas I work for a long time, continuous, like silicon now 15 years lithium metal, maybe close to eight years, even 10 years, right? Uh, uh, and Doron was uh, right in saying, you know, even at the beginning, some of the design, uh, they are not practical, but uh, they present the uh, chemistry and material to solve the problem. And then after we learn about design principle, then we kind of want, want to find a way to implement those thinking in a practical way, that's the second step. So I enjoy uh, those the most, uh, this silicon and lithium metal. Actually, just sulfur, part of that, and sulfur also, uh, we, we see that I didn't talk about today. Then other research area like textile, very exciting also. So we actually launching commercial product in the last few weeks, I mean, warming and cooling textile successfully. Uh, my Greek scale energy storage company, Nickel Hydrogen Gas, right? Well, that's looking very exciting as well. I didn't talk about today. Uh, but that one, we only work on that those for about four or five years. The degree of complexity in terms of chemistry and materials, I think, uh, maybe not to the level like silicon, lithium, metal, and sulfur. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe questions from the audience. Uh, you can open microphones and uh, simply uh, uh, jump into the discussion. I believe everybody can open this microphone, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody could open. I have just uh, maybe a, a technical question. From early on in the talk, you showed these uh, micro emulsions uh, uh, encapsulated uh, with uh, carbon, and I'm just wondering about the size of those. If these are mono dispersed, what were the considerations in the size of those uh, and how you controlled that? Yeah, well, Sydney, the uh, the nanoparticle we start with is about 80 nanometers. Um, our thinking is picking the diameter small enough, needs to be below 150 nanometer to avoid mechanical breaking. Uh, so that's for the nano size. And then for the secondary particle micro emulsion, how do we control the secondary particle size by using, well, what's your uh, water droplet size inside the oil? That's one knob we can tune. The second knob we can tune is the nanoparticle dispersion concentration, right? If it's in the aqueous solution, you reduce the concentration after the water droplet evaporate, the same water droplet size evaporate, then you have less particle, then your secondary, secondary particles size will be smaller. So we are, we are trying to target in the range of about, you know, close to five micron secondary particle size. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was a question on the chat. If you look on the chat, there was a, a long question in there. Okay. Let me see. How can we practically design high volumetric energy dense silicon and I feel giving buff, buffer space or silicon. 
Uh, yes, uh, this is a good question. So this is a, a, a question I think people ask a lot and discuss a lot, right? Well, you know, silicon volume expansion is so much. If you leave a lot, leave a lot of empty space, right? There was how much volumetric energy density can you still maintain? So let me give you a parameter first. You have silicon. If you put lithium in, silicon can expand four times. After expansion, let me emphasize, after expansion, Lithiate is silicon, it's volumetric capacity, milliamp hour per centimeter cube. So milliamp hour per cc is 2000 roughly. That's actually very, very high. That's about uh, three times, about three times of graphite uh, in, in, theoretically, you know. So then you say, well, if I build silicon, I need to leave the space right there for the expansion. I have a one volume of silicon. If I leave uh, three times of that, I don't fully use silicon capacity. You expand to three times, fill that space. You still can get to somewhere about practically 1500 million hour per centimeter cube. This is exper uh, experimentally we see in the electro level. Then you say that's a doubling of uh, graphite volumetric capacity. Uh, uh, more than double, right? Graphite practically probably you get to about 600 or so million hour per cc. So still, still quite good, you know, about double to three times of graphite in, in that range. But for That's aviation, you... but for aviation, it's good enough. Avia for, for aviation, you, you, you showed application of, for aviation. It's good enough, yeah. For aviation, the, 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 the gravimetric energy density is the most important rather than the volumetric. That, that's right. Uh, Dolan, you're completely right. Even for volumetric, right? If you look at Empress battery, it, it gets to about 1200 to 1300 watt per liter, right? Compared to now lithium ion, maybe lithium ion is about, uh, uh, while well, using graphite, 700, 750 watt per liter range. So it, it's, it's possible to use silicon with high volumetric energy density. Uh, let's see. I think I answered the questions. It's all about volumetrics. Yeah, I think it's this long uh, writing is all about volumetrics. Thank you for uh, asking this question. Um, so again, are there any other questions or comments? Um, so I think that if there's no uh, 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 comments or, or, or questions, in fact, the talk was very clear, uh, uh, Professor Tui, and I believe that I see, I see the names. Uh, many of the people, well, I know many of the audience, and they, 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 they follow your work. So you're not new for us, and you follow your work, but it's again always nice to see you, even if it, if it is in 2D, it's nice to see you even in two dimensions <laughs> uh, uh, on, on the screen and, and see again and again the, the scope of work, which is inspiring. So again, uh, you know, if, if anyone asks you questions about practical issues, you can simply <laughs> deny that there's no, there's no issue here. The level of innovation is important for the sake of chemistry, for the sake of chemical science. So demonstrating the power of material science and the use of the right chemistry and physics, and in fact, using all our understanding, knowledge, capability in material science to come with a new structures that uh, struggle with metastability with the most, uh, most reactive systems in nature. And this, is, this has a, a, an independent value, uh, independent to practicality. And of course, this work has its own practical uh, importance, but beyond practical import, importance, it, it has independent importance by the beauty of chemistry. And this is an important uh, a, a, a message that I like to convey. Uh, and uh, please, this is the way you should answer if, if there's any criticism about, uh, let's say, exotic uh, solutions or exotic, uh, um, um, exotic uh, development. Uh, this exotic development has their own, let's say, independent, uh, independent value for for chemists, for material science. Well, so okay. I believe that uh, we, we can conclude the, the, the this beautiful talk. Yes, so and we, the... uh, thank you very much for 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 being with us, and uh, we look forward to have you again, again.
with us thank in Israel, physically, in any, any, in any dimension. Doron has said everything. Thank you again on behalf of IVS for having uh, uh, delighted us with your presentation. And I hope really that we finish with this uh, virus thing and that we can have you here in person and it will be much, much more fun than uh, doing over Zoom. But thank you for in the meantime for the Zoom. That was absolutely great. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, my friend and Israel. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.